I love platformers, 3D platformers, 2D side-scrollers, whatever you want to call them or whatever it may be, I grew up playing so many of them. Honestly, most of it was a lot of Mario Nintendo stuff because I was just that kind of kid. I also grew up in the lower end of middle class conditions, so I never really had a lot of room to ask for a PlayStation or something. For a very good portion of my childhood, all I had was a Game Boy Advance, DS, and a Wii. But I was perfectly fine with these options, they all had their share of great games, and it's not like I was completely unaware of the non-Nintendo platforming mascots. I learned about Crash through playing the original CTR with an old friend of mine, just from playing Season of Ice and Season of Flame I became a fan of Spyro, little did I know these are probably up there as some of the worst entries in the series, and I think I found out about Jack and Daxter by watching my cousin play one of the games on the PSP, or maybe it was the Vita. It could have honestly been Ratchet and Clank, I really don't remember, it's a very faint memory. Out of all of these characters though, there's one that really managed to catch my eye in my later years, and that's none other than, you've guessed it, Rayman! <laughs> Little known fact, he was once the face of Ubisoft way before they even had an Assassin's Creed or Far Cry cow to milk dry. And before they even decided that they should bring the Ubi and Soft together in their logo. For such a minor change, I really think it's what marked the start of the company's gradual decline. With a character design that is this bizarre, it's hard to really not feel at least the slightest bit of curiosity and interest on what these games are about, yet that's also a part of what makes Rayman great as a character. The fact that he's almost indescribable is what makes him so unique and memorable among the sea of other platforming mascots. Despite this, Rayman always sort of loomed in the underground. I don't hear a lot of people talk about him, and I don't think he was ever even close to reaching the status of being a household name, apart from maybe his country of origin. I've always wondered why, uh, but that's not something I'll be answering today, at least not intentionally. Instead, I just want to look back at the Limbless Man's trilogy and see how each of these games have progressed and how well they hold up today, simply because I love this character way too much and I want to do something special. Rayman, vous avez toujours voulu faire ce métier Oui. Votre couleur de cheveux est naturelle Ouais. Et pour les cascades, vous êtes doublé Non. Vous, vous pouvez nous faire une petite démonstration Ouais Rayman, c'est... Yeah of course, we'll be starting off with Rayman 1, released September 1995, developed by Ubisoft Montpellier and being the brainchild of Michel Ancel. And before you bombard me in the comments, I'm sorry if I brutally mispronounced any of that. I tried my best, but I'm not French. <laughs> Very early in its development, Rayman 1 was originally planned for the SNES. However, eventually focus shifted to bringing it onto the Atari Jaguar, because Ansel and company felt that its 64-bit cartridge system would be enough to handle the game. At first, it was planned to be a Jaguar exclusive, but it was later decided that it should become a launch title for the PlayStation, which then snowballed it into being released on the Sega Saturn. Then the PC, and then the Game Boy Color in advance, then the DSi, and then finally iOS and Android. If you think that's a lot of ports, wait until we get to Rayman 2. Since I don't own some of those consoles anymore or straight up didn't have them to begin with, I'll be covering the PC version, more specifically Rayman Forever, which is a bundle that also comes with Rayman Level Designer and Rayman by his fans, or basically a collection of fan-made levels that were made using the level designer. Unfortunately, this version of Rayman already has some small issues, one of which being that this version doesn't feature the game's entire soundtrack, which is honestly a huge letdown and I'll talk about that a little later. Thankfully, this can be remedied in a bunch of ways. I went about it by using the Rayman control panel by Raycarrot, which is a fucking lifesaver. Without this, I don't think I would have been able to actually make this video. It's mostly used to tweak the Rayman games so they can run better on modern systems, but for some titles, there are a few goodies you can enable like having the full soundtrack for this game. If you want to play some of the older Rayman games on PC, I say this is a bit of a must-have. Sadly, one thing that it doesn't fix is bringing back the opening cutscene, which is actually missing from this version entirely. This isn't a huge deal breaker, but without it, you have no idea what this game is even about. Not like it has a very deep story, but when the main character looks like this, I feel like the players deserve some sort of explanation on what the fuck is actually going on. Thankfully, the other versions do this quite well by opening the game with the Magician, a character who's kind of like a narrator here. He tells you that everyone and everything living in Rayman land live in harmony all thanks to the Great Protoon, which is this magical looking orb. 
Then the evil bastard that comes in named Mr. Dark steals it, defeats the guardian of the orb Batilla the Fairy, and then fucks off with it to do evil things. All the while, the Electoons, which are just kind of inhabitants of this world, get stuffed into small cages. The only man who could save the Electoons and defeat the evil Mr. Dark is none other than Rayman himself, who looks as if he really can't be bothered to do any of this. But he starts his journey anyway, and as Rayman you're given all of his awesome acrobatic abilities, like being able to walk and jump. And, uh, wait, that's it? No, that can't be right. Can't this dude, like, uh, fly around with his hair or something? Give me answers. You can now punch with your fist. Oh, uh, so this is how it's gonna go. Alright then. Yeah, for a very large part of the early game, you have the most basic and limited moveset you can imagine. I mean, you can't even run. But despite this, I will say these early levels are really well designed. They are entirely built to have you make the most out of what little you have. Before you even unlock the ability to punch, you can still actually defeat enemies by spooking them, which is a little situational and pretty inefficient, so the game would rather have you avoid these enemies like obstacles instead of trying to fight them. And since you don't have your helicopter hair yet, the game introduces you to plums, your simple solution to literally everything. Want to get up to a platform that's a little too high for you to reach? Use the plum. Are there too many enemies in your way? Use the plum. Need to get across a large body of water? Plum. In the Rayman universe, these things are like fucking Swiss army knives. There isn't a single thing out there that they can't do. Something else I love about these early levels is that once you're able to throw punches, literally right after the first level, the game shows you that each enemy reacts differently to your attack. There's the basic living stones that are really just there to take a beating from you, but you also have the smaller versions of them which will duck under your punches, so the only way you could get rid of them is if you hit them from behind. There's also the dark tunes, which are way too small for you to hit normally, so what you have to do instead is punch and quickly crouch down so your fist hits them on its way back to you. And the hunters, which you can't punch until they put their gun away. Making the enemies this reactive is a really neat way of teaching you all the ways you could utilize such a simple move. You also have a bunch of different power-ups, like the little P which refills some of your health, and the big P which gives you an extra two hits. Then there's the golden fist that lets you do extra damage, and the speed fist which I feel is pretty self-explanatory. Fun fact, Rayman was originally supposed to have limbs, but due to a rendering issue he was made limbless, which thankfully caused Ansel and company to work around this issue by just sticking with it, unintentionally making him much more memorable. And if it wasn't for this, Rayman probably would have never gotten the slick ability to literally throw his fists. It won't take you very long to reach the first boss fight, which is with Bazit the Mosquito. Super easy and simple, just keep punching him until he goes down. You don't even have to wait through his entire attack cycle, just give him a big old bop whenever he gets near you. After the fight, Rayman and Bazit become friends. I do like the wholesomeness of this, but I have to ask, why are we forgiving him? This dude flew up and tried throwing hands for no goddamn reason. Rayman, I admire your kindness, but if I were you, I'd just spray him down with some raid. Maybe I'm being a little too negative, but Zip becomes pretty chill and you take a quick joyride with him through the next part of the level. Actually, that's something I haven't mentioned yet. How Rayman goes about doing levels is very different. You have the level that you see and select on the map, but once you start playing it, that level is divided into a bunch of different sub-levels. As far as I'm aware, I don't think there's been any other game that's done this before or since. And something else to note is that you can only exit out of a level through the first sub-level by this wooden sign. After this, the only other way you can get back to the map is by finishing the level entirely or force quitting. Uh, sorry if I said level one too many times, I don't think I could have explained that any other way than having to repeat it ad nauseum. Ooh, a new power-up. What's it going to be this time? The power to hang. Oh my god, you have to be shitting me. Rayman was already able to climb up Vine since level 1, and you're telling me that simply holding onto a ledge is something he was completely clueless about up until now, when we're about halfway through the first fucking world. I, I don't even understand why this is here, like you'd think maybe being able to hang onto platforms becomes a more integral part of the level design since you unlock it, but nope. Not really. Sure, it's nice to have, but it would have been better to have it from the very beginning rather than just dropping it onto the player randomly. It's as if Batilla completely forgot about this, like she just flies up to you and is like, shit, those fucking hands you got, you could use them for stuff. I don't know if you already knew that, you're fucking take this. And if you're wondering when you get helicopter hair or even the ability to run, well, you don't get the former until World 2 and the latter until the end of World 3. Yes, you can't run until you get halfway through the game. 
Normally I don't think I'd really have a problem with this, but it's just the fact that when you have such a limited moveset, Rayman is really sluggish to control. I think it might be a little hard to really notice it in these early levels because the platforming here is pretty simple, but it becomes very apparent once you come across the Magician. You'll find him in certain levels and giving him 10 tings, which are these blue things, throws you into a random little challenge minigame, which upon completing them grants you an extra life. Now yes, I understand that they're bonus challenges and their entire point is to be challenging, but that is really taken to a huge extreme here. Like this one which is in the first level, you have to collect 13 tings in 35 seconds while climbing up these small platforms. Sounds easy, right? But the thing is, since you can't really get a good running start, you don't exactly have a lot of freedom to correct yourself mid-jump, and you can't even hang onto the platforms because for some godforsaken reason that's just not something Rayman knows how to do yet, you really have to rely on just being incredibly precise with your timing. I'm not kidding, even if you're just a tiny bit off, you could end up tumbling all the way down to the bottom, killing your run pretty much instantly, all because like I mentioned previously, Rayman without any of his fancy movement abilities is not nearly agile enough to be doing jumps like these, especially in 35 seconds. Other than that though, I will say this first world is pretty enjoyable. Again, I like that these levels are designed for the players to familiarize themselves with Barebones Rayman before moving on to fight the last boss here, which is, uh, bzzit? Actually no, this is Mosquito. Clever name, I know. A completely different character that is actually evil unlike Bazit. I know this is a little confusing since they both look the same, but this is just a graphical issue on the PC. On the console versions, both these characters have their own sprites. As for the fight, it's just like Bazit's except for a few new extra attacks that are pretty easy to avoid. I do want to mention though that this dude's fight theme goes way too hard, and I guess now is actually a good time to bring up just how amazing this game's soundtrack is. If you haven't noticed, I use songs from all three of these games quite frequently in my videos because, well let's just get this out of the way, this is some of the best top tier shit I've ever fucking listened to. Although I will admit I do prefer 2 and 3 soundtrack over this, Rayman 1 still holds its own weight really well because of just how varied and different each track is to capture the feel of the setting you're in. Upon starting your journey, you're greeted with the most delightful and happy sounding tune you'll ever hear in any game to go along with the vibrant forced scenery. Of course, there's no other type of music that'll be more fitting to listen to when you're fighting against a giant saxophone than some smooth jazz. Then when you're up against a giant scorpion, here's some ancient Egyptian Arabic vibes for you. I especially love some of the more ambient tracks in this game because of how ridiculously soothing they are to listen to. My favorite of these has to be the one that plays when you're in the caves. After you defeat Mosquito, you unlock another ability, this time it's being able to grab things with your fist, which might sound kind of useless, but it's actually pretty helpful. One of its main and primary uses is allowing you to grapple onto these things which are known as pink lums. Other than that, you could also grab one-ups with your fists, which is neat, but really the amount of times you're given the chance to actually do this is few and far between. I tend to even forget that you can do this sometimes, and it doesn't help that the game doesn't even demonstrate it here. Alright, on to World 2, Bandland. Something Rayman 1 excels at is being original. I really like that you don't go through the roller coaster of seeing the same generic worlds you'd have in any other platformer. You know, like the standard desert levels, beach levels, ice levels. In Rayman, you instead get worlds made out of musical instruments with enemies that tie into that theme, like these evil musical notes, rocket powered maracas, and bugs, I, I guess. There's also Picture City, a world made entirely out of arts and crafts. But uh, don't let the colorful visuals and the happy cartoon characters fool you. you. See my lives counter up there? Yeah, that's all legit. Now who am I kidding I cheated that in? I think I've been keeping this band-aid on for a little too long and it's about time I rip it off. Something I ought to know about Rayman 1 is that it's fucking hard. Yes, I know within the Rayman community this is an opinion that's regurgitated constantly, but 
what can I say, it is undeniably true. And actually, for those of you who've had very little to no exposure to Rayman before, I'd love to see you play this and hear just how far you can go without cheats. With enough perseverance, Bongo Hills, the first level of Bandland, could be doable for a newbie, but after that you're probably not going to have enough in your tank to get through the next level or two. And I'm not even saying that to make myself sound superior, I'm almost in the exact same boat as you. This is actually my first time properly playing Rayman 1, and I'm not gonna lie, this was easily the most agonizing and torturous game that I've ever had to sit through. My entire time spent playing Rayman 1, I constantly felt that I was just one bullshit bottomless pitfall away from throwing myself off of a 5 story building. And believe me, this game has its fair share of those. Bottomless pits, I mean, not a uh, 5 story buildings. You wanna hear an ugly truth too? I went through Bandland again on a separate save, and you know what? Compared to the absolute fuckery this game constantly throws you into later on, Bandland is pretty playable. Now I won't say it's easy, because by the end of it I barely passed by the skin of my teeth, as you can see here in this boss fight I was down to one life and I've gone through about three continues, which I'll talk about in a bit. Once you get to the second level Allegro Presto, it becomes a little obvious that this game is slowly starting to grow tired of your shit. While Bongo Hills is the first to introduce you to slippery platforms, Allegro Presto abuses them and makes them even more annoying than they already are in any other platformer. You see this? This is literally the first 10 seconds of the second part to this level. What you are looking at is me trying to climb up a bunch of tiny slippery platforms all the while I get pushed around by a bunch of sentient trumpets causing me to zoom around almost uncontrollably. And yet the game somehow expects you to nail the pixel perfect timing required to get past this. Don't get me wrong, this whole part is frustrating beyond belief and it's quite possibly the worst way you could start off any level, but this is just mere child's play. I mean, you can't even die here. Though once you progress a little further, the stakes are raised a little bit and now the game wants to see how well you can balance on these while they're hovering over a bottomless pit. I really can't stand that this whole level barely has any solid ground either. It is just these platforms. Like Jesus Christ, I can't even activate the checkpoint because I keep slipping away from it. Then going back to Bongo Hills, it seems like its entire shtick is spawning things randomly, whether it's enemies, platforms, or items. This is actually something that the game does since the very beginning, and I hate it. You see, sometimes when you collect items or walk through a certain point, it will trigger a system that will spawn in extra enemies or some other things. And as far as I'm aware, the only indicator you get for this is a little sound effect. Sometimes you don't even really know what happens because it'll spawn something off screen. I can somewhat tolerate this whole thing in the first world, but in Bongo Hills, this is when the game starts using the system to punish you. Like right here, you're strolling up to three tings laying on the ground. You think you could just collect them normally, but nope, surprise bitch, here's some fucking bugs. Here you've got a seemingly normal, inconspicuous health pickup, but when you go to yoink it, all of a sudden the drums right next to you grow a pair of eyeballs and start shooting lightning bolts at you. If you fail to react to this random split second change, that health pickup you just got will be as good as a one legged man in an ass kicking contest. Oh and believe me, this shit only gets worse from here. These levels also have a tendency to throw obstacles in your way before you even have a chance to react to whatever's going on. All of this combined together makes Rayman a really infuriating game of trial and error. Most of these later levels practically force you to lose lives just so you can memorize everything from top to bottom. Which doesn't really sound like a bad thing by itself, but with how sparse checkpoints are in these levels, oftentimes when you die you'll end up losing a lot of progress, and you have to march your way back hoping that you'll be able to get past whatever it is that you're stuck on. And this entire process is especially painful to go through when lives and continues are something you need to worry about. Which let me take a moment and explain how those work here. You start off with 3 lives, and you can increase that count by picking 1-ups. All pretty standard stuff. If you lose all of them, you get booted to a game over screen which displays that you also have 10 continues, and you can't increase that count. If you lose all of your continues, you're brought back to the main menu and you have to start from wherever your last save was. Honestly, I really think this game would have been a lot more enjoyable if you didn't have to deal with this. There's a reason why they're slowly starting to fade away from modern platformers and why certain games like Super Meat Boy don't even have them. They don't do anything, they just waste the player's time testing their patience and keeping them from instantly jumping back into another attempt. There's nothing fun about having to sit through a game over screen that you'll be seeing repeatedly, then getting unnecessarily punished all because you can't exactly figure out a certain part of the level. 
It's like trying to learn to play the guitar for the first time, but every time you mess up a note, you get smashed over the head with it. <sighs> you know, I really surprised myself with how far I actually got. Really, it seemed like every other level was putting me at my wit's end and pushing me closer to just dropping this game entirely. World 3 Blue Mountains also had a good amount of moments that were complete bullshit. In the level Twilight Gulch, there's a part where the boss of this world, Mr. Stone, appears and starts chasing you down, turning the level into an auto-scroller. The first time I did this, I lost a lot of lives, but looking back at it, this isn't the worst part. The part that really baffled me is when Mr. Stone chases you again, and at the end of it all, you have to jump right into the small crevice. Now, don't worry about him stomping around above you. At this point, he's not even a real threat anymore. However, what you do need to worry about is getting to the other side of this crevice to trigger a cloud to spawn in so you could get out of here. But how exactly do you do that when the path is being blocked by a bunch of bouncing magma rocks? Crawling underneath them isn't going to work because you'll just take damage no matter what, so what you have to do instead is punch each and every one of them and then barely avoid the shrapnel they shoot out. Then you could head over to the other side. Once you're done with that, you might be wondering how do you jump from here, over these spikes, and onto the cloud? Clearly, you're not thinking hard enough because what you obviously need to do is go onto this teeny tiny space that has no spikes and then hop over to the cloud. You see why this whole part is utter horseshit? Nothing is made clear to the player. There's nothing that tells you that this spot will trigger a cloud to spawn in, apart from maybe these few tings. Even though the game already establishes that these rocks can be broken, I'm sure any player would actually hesitate doing that here because of just how little space there is to avoid the shit they'll be flying out of them once they break. And after all of that, the game just doesn't even bother giving you the slightest hint on how exactly you're supposed to progress further. I also have to give an honorable mention to this part right here. More tiny slippery platforms over a bottomless pit and half their space is being taken up by more of these rocks. This isn't good fun level design, it's like these were made to ensure that the player has the most miserable experience playing this game. The next world picture city is really the last stop for a lot of players and I can't blame them. You've got the level pencil pentathlon which to put it simply just sucks, it just fucking sucks. Let's talk about how one of the parts to this level opens up with just a bunch of bouncy eraser platforms, and you're expected to somehow weasel your way down to the bottom of them. And don't think for a second you'll find some easy shortcut. If you go all the way to the right, you just get a message that says no. Once you manage to go through this, you then have to put up with one of the most brutal jumps in this entire game. You have to make your way through this narrow gap between two rows of sharp pencils. Getting hit by them causes you to take damage. You would think that this is a test to see how good your timing is, but nope. You can try as hard as you want, but no matter where you jump off from, you're always going to take damage. You know what you need to do instead? Just walk forward. You don't even need to jump. After this, you have the infamous Space Mama's Crater. As god-awful as the sublevels are that come before this fight, for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to jump right into the meat and potatoes here, which is the fight with Space Mama. A fight that will start off with you getting hit because Jesus Christ, how are you even supposed to know that's an obstacle not just part of the opening animation? Then followed by the most drawn out attacks that can be almost impossible to dodge, then followed up by a phase that goes on for way too fucking long and also becomes way too fucking hard to dodge. This is why cheating in lives has become normalized when it comes to playing Rayman 1. There isn't anything fun about wasting your continues on this brutally unforgiving boss fight, then being expected to run through all the sub-levels that come before this again, and just hoping you don't fuck up too many times so you have enough health to do this shit again. Uh oh. Mr. Dark kidnaps Batilla the Fairy. Ah uh, jeez, for what seems like such a crucial story element, I expected, uh, I don't know, a little bit more emotion maybe? The font is nice though. Many people cite Space Mama's Crater as being the hardest level in the game, but honestly, this didn't even prepare me for the hell that I'll be going through. Eat at Joe's. A level that, all things considered, doesn't actually start off too bad. Sure, the first part is annoying, but it's not like I'd much rather hammer a nail directly into my left eyeball kind of annoying, except for the final part. This was my breaking point. This was when Rayman finally got the best of me. As innocent as this looks, and how cheerful that beach music sounds, don't let any of it deceive you. I don't think there's been any level that has left me wanting to put a fist-sized hole into my monitor as much as this one. I'm gonna break this entire thing down into three parts. You have the very start, where you do precise platforming on some small beach balls. You'll probably die here a couple of times, but I don't think it should really take you all that long to eventually get the hang of it. 
but the next two parts are when this level becomes the most aneurysm-inducing gauntlet of some of the dumbest tripe this game can throw at you. Part 5 introduces you to beach balls that move at a snail's pace because you gotta wait for this big-nosed fish to nudge the ball along. You gotta do a really stupid jump that you can easily fuck up, and then part 3 where the game decides to bring in the hell spawn that are these bucktooth barracudas. These motherfuckers will lunge out of the water, and if you get hit by them, I guarantee you it is going to happen, and it's going to happen a lot, you're just going to die. Because the only thing you stand on in this level are these stupid floating beach balls, and when Rayman gets hit by anything, he throws himself off by about 5 feet from wherever he was. Giving you no chance at recovering yourself, so you're just going to drown. And you'll be thrown back to the start of the level where you're greeted yet again by Joe's dumb ugly face. It doesn't matter how you try to avoid these guys, getting hit by them seems like it's almost entirely up to a coin toss. There were so many moments where I thought for sure that I nailed it, but it just doesn't happen. And then on the rare moments where I get lucky, it turns out these bastards love going for seconds, so I guess fuck me for not knowing that this game always has some other trick up its sleeve. I know you could hit these guys too, and that is probably the most reliable way you could get past them, but even then, this still isn't exactly foolproof. This is still something that requires a bit of timing, though compared to trying to jump over these fish, it's much more forgiving. It genuinely makes no sense to me why this level is as difficult as it is. I mean, I know we're approaching the end here, but this is just fucking ridiculous. Fug fact, the reason this game is so extremely difficult is because it was never playtested by an actual QA team. Yep, the only bit of playtesting this game got was from the developers themselves. And of course for them it was mostly easy because they made the levels. To back this up, here's a quote from a Q&A done with game director of Rayman Origins, Sebastian Morin, that was once available on Ubisoft's official website as a blog post. When asked, the first Rayman is known for its incredible difficulty, which made finishing it quite an achievement. Will Rayman Origins be as hard? Morin responds, At the time of the first Rayman, we didn't playtest our games that much. That was a big issue, because game developers don't know the real difficulty of their own games. They have something like hundreds of hours of flight when a player is still learning to fly, so we end up with quite a difficult game, but we're not really aware of it. I can't bash you for liking this game's difficulty. In fact, I actually kind of admire that ability to still get immense enjoyment out of a game that is as spiteful and as punishing as this. But something that does strike a bit of a nerve with me that I commonly see around forums or comments is when people defend the difficulty, and they also say that they've practically mastered the game under that same breath. Yet again, I do really admire these people for having enough patience to become super familiar with every bit of this game to the point that they could breeze through most of it with ease, but just because you were able to do that doesn't mean that the game is super easy or well designed. I'm not trying to sound like a game analysis know-it-all, and if you've ever thought that I was that, well I'm inclined to believe that you might have been smoking something. However, I will say truthfully and with confidence that yeah, this game is way too hard. And as you saw from that quote earlier, the devs feel the exact same way. You could use the phrase easy to pick up, hard to master for a dozen games, Rayman 1 is definitely not one of them. The first few levels lull you into thinking this is a nice, simple platforming adventure, but after that it just becomes an endurance test of how far you can go before you want to kick it into the bin and set it on fire. And it's not even purely because it's hard. There are difficult games that are enjoyable, but the reason they are that way is due to design choices that add in an element of fairness. The ultimate goal is to make sure the player fully understands that every death is their own fault, that they could realize that maybe they should jump a little earlier, or a little later, take it a bit slower, or go a little faster. This is done by pretty much just leaving the player to their own devices. These games don't rely on cheap tricks or sudden surprises that cause the player to be completely thrown off guard. No, these are simple, pure challenges that test how well the player knows the game. Now Rayman on the other hand is pretty much difficult by complete accident. Yes, there's a few moments here and there where the game does properly test the player's skills, but that is vastly outweighed by the sheer amount of flawed design choices here that aren't carefully crafted to make sure the player has a nice, challenging, but fair experience. They were just kind of haphazardly thrown in, and no one on the team really thought twice about some of the things that should have been reconsidered. Because I mean really, what is the player supposed to be getting from something like this, where the only thing you're legitimately supposed to do is nothing at all? Slippery platforms are always an iffy thing to play around with in these types of games, but there are ways you can make them so they're actually fun. 
having a level that almost entirely consists of them, and then randomly throwing these weird precise platforming bits where the player barely has any control over themselves is definitely not a way you could go about doing this. While we're on the topic of more things that are poorly designed, let's talk about scops. A boss that is surprisingly easy, but I see a lot of people struggling with this one, and it's not really their fault. You see, one of Scops' attacks is that he shoots an energy ball. Not to the uninitiated, this looks as if it's homing in on you, so most people would think that you have to juke it out and make it hit Scops right in the face. However, when you do this, you're making this fight so much harder than it actually is. That's because this projectile doesn't actually lock onto Rayman, it locks onto his fists. How would you figure that out for yourself? I don't fucking know, it's just another one of those things that isn't made very obvious to the player. So understandably, many misinterpret this attack entirely and end up getting frustrated because it's just another part of the game that wasn't very well thought out. Finally, it's time to move on to the last level, and I'm not even going to pretend like I don't know what's coming up. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this is one of the biggest gacha moments you will see in any game. You can't get to the last level. You can't defeat the evil Mr. Dark without 100% completing the entire game. Yes, you fucking heard me. And how do you do this? Well, remember when I brought up how all the Electoons were stuffed into little cages? Yeah, those cages are scattered around every level, and you need to find and break all of them. This means that you're going to have to replay all of the levels that you hate with every fiber of your being, but that's not even the worst part. The worst part is dealing with that atrocious spawning system that I brought up earlier. Rayman 1 doesn't really hide its collectibles like any other game, where they reward you for wanting to explore and being curious. Well, actually the first few levels might be like that, but after this, shit becomes so fucking cryptic that you really don't know if the game is just leading you to your own demise. If you want to do this blindly, it takes way too much guesswork for something that is a strict prerequisite for you to actually finish the game. And because of that, you're most likely going to end up replaying the same level a good dozen times, carefully checking every possible nook and cranny that could cause a cage to spawn in. I swear, if you want further proof that this game has some sort of personal vendetta against you, there's this part in Pencil Pentathlon. I know you can't see it or hear it, but being a literal pubic hair away from this exit sign causes a cage to spawn right below you. And by the time you even realized what just happened, you're already in the next level. So yeah, you're just going to have to replay this again just to get that one lousy cage. Thankfully, there's walkthroughs to help you out if you're ever in the mood to torture yourself with this. Look, I really hate to disappoint, but I just couldn't bring myself to do this. I'm sorry, I just didn't enjoy this game enough to want to take my time and 100% complete it just to play the last level. And I can't do any level skip cheats because the PC version has this really annoying exception. And unlike the other versions, there's no level passwords here either, so I really have no other choice than to just take my sweet ass time and play through everything again. For what it's worth, I did get the cages for some of the earlier levels, and I will say it's fun to revisit these with all of Rayman's abilities unlocked. I didn't bring this up earlier, but there's a bunch of alternate paths here that become accessible once Rayman's kit becomes fully decked out, making these levels still feel new and refreshing. However, a huge part of me feels like the same can't be said for the rest of the game. You could call me lazy if you want, and you wouldn't be wrong for saying that. Even though I didn't finish it, I also feel like I'm not really missing out on anything. I know for damn sure that one level won't suddenly change my entire perspective on this game. I made up my mind on where this belongs on the old tier list back when I first got to Blue Mountains, and sadly I'm throwing Rayman 1 into C tier. I know this one is a classic, it started the whole series, and it played a part in some of your guys' childhoods, but for me, someone who has no nostalgia for this, all I'm really getting is a game that has aged poorly because of its brutal soul-crushing difficulty, and at times it's incredibly poor level design that's all largely due to a lack of playtesting. If you wanted to get into the Rayman series, I'd suggest giving this one a very hard pass. And I'm not trying to make this seem like the worst game ever, it genuinely bums me out a little that I didn't enjoy this one as much as I wanted to, and underneath all of its huge flaws I could see a game that would have otherwise been very fun. It's got the bright colorful visuals, the satisfyingly fluid animations, the unique characters and environments, and that soundtrack which is just incredible. Hell, I even said the first world was very enjoyable because I mean this, I feel like it's the only part of the game that has the most amount of care and thought be put into its level design and how everything should play out. If only the game didn't quickly throw you headfirst into such a huge difficulty spike shortly after that just isn't fun to overcome at all, this game would have easily been ranked at an A. Now what if I told you there was a way you could actually play Rayman 1 without wanting to commit seppuku at every step of the way? 
Say hello to Rayman Redemption, a free-to-play fan-made remake done by Raimani, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. It adds a whole new world to explore between Cave of Scops and Mr. Dark, there's new collectibles, new bosses, additional levels, you have all of Rayman's abilities the moment you start level 1, and all of the levels have gone through massive glow-ups to make way for this change. Best part is, you don't need to go through 100% completion to fight Mr. Dark. Honestly, it's a little too easy, I mean, I managed to beat Eat at Joe's only in my second attempt, at the same time, though, I'm not really complaining. But if the difficulty is something that you think you'll end up missing for whatever reason, you can choose to play the game in classic mode to bring back lives. This was my first time playing the original Rayman 1, but I've played a good bit of Rayman Redemption way before this. I really mean it when I say this, but hands down, Redemption is the best way you could experience the original if you've never played it. The difficulty is way more gradual, and because of that, it's much more accessible. The levels are all very tightly designed, and I can't lie, I just had so much more fun playing this. It never really feels like the game is actively trying to work against you. It is essentially a modernized version of Rayman 1. Now, I know I made the original seem like a very rough start to the trilogy, but it did receive a lot of support, mostly for its presentation and soundtrack. The gameplay did receive a lot of flack, unsurprisingly, even for its time, Rayman 1 was exceptionally difficult. However, the support was enough to actually grant the Limbless Man a sequel. This is Rayman. This is a man called Ray. Rayman is the star of the action-adventure game Rayman 2. Ray is not. Rayman can shoot, swim, swing, fly, and even water ski. Ray cannot. Rayman has friends and enemies in dozens of epic worlds. Ray has a sister in Florida. So, remember, it's Rayman, not Ray. Rayman 2 for Nintendo 64. Rayman 2 The Great Escape. Escape released a whopping four years after the original, which might not sound too bad, but when you look into this game's development history and how it was apparently supposed to be released only a year after the original, I can't be the only one that thinks it's a little shocking. This huge increase in development time was primarily because of how the mid to late 90s were suddenly dominated by 3D platformers with games like Crash Bandicoot and Spyro, while other already established franchises were making that jump like Super Mario, Gex, and uh, even Bubsy. It's not to say that making a 2D platformer during this time would result in an immediate financial flop, but it would have been a huge missed opportunity. People wanted to experience and see the capabilities of what's possible with this new technology. Even though making games in 3D was still something that was very early in its infancy, it was still super impressive and, needless to say, attracted a lot of attention. This went against Ubisoft's original plan of making Rayman 2 a direct sequel to the original. Not in terms of story, but more so gameplay. Rayman 2 was supposed to stay as a 2D platformer utilizing pre-rendered graphics. Its difficulty would have been toned down and apparently had a small emphasis on puzzle solving. It went into development shortly after the original release, and according to the Sega Saturn magazine published sometime August of 1996, it was already pretty far into development around this time and likely would have been ready in late autumn of that year. However, this version of Rayman 2 was eventually scrapped after the developers saw gameplay footage of Crash Bandicoot and decided that they should bring Rayman into 3D. There was just one small issue though. Believe it or not, at this point in time, Ubisoft has never made a single 3D game before and they barely knew what they were going in for. So they decided to do a bit of a dry run. Michel Ancel conceptualized the idea for another game known as Tonic Trouble and handed over development duties to Ubisoft Montreal to test the 3D engine they planned on using for Rayman 2. All of this is what drastically extended the game's development time from just one year to four. But the world finally got its hands on the Rayman 2 we all know and love today on October 31st, 1999 on the Nintendo 64, then on the PC, and Dreamcast and PlayStation 1, and PlayStation 2, and Game Boy Color, and Nintendo DS, and PlayStation 3, and PlayStation Vita, and PSP, and iOS, and then finally the 3DS. I'm going to assume that the only reason they stopped there is because Ubisoft themselves even realized that they've gone a little overboard on the ports. For a time, it wouldn't even matter what generation you were born into, it still would have been possible for you to get this game on release date for one of these systems. I should also mention that a majority of these ports don't offer the same consistent experience. They all had a handful of differences, both technically and in terms of gameplay. So if you played this on the PS1, well, guess what? 
who played what is considered to be one of the most inferior versions of this game, mostly because some of the levels were removed and those that weren't were drastically reduced in length, so you're only experiencing about half of what the original offers. A fun fact about this version though is that you can play a small level long demo of the original Rayman 2 prototype if you reach 90% completion. But other than that, there's also the DS version which suffers from being really unpolished and iOS which has touchscreen controls. The PS2 version or Rayman Revolution gets a lot of praise but it's almost a completely different game. That's because it's actually kind of like a remake of the PS1 version. It offers everything that the definitive versions have and then some. It has an open hub world a bunch of new content, and a lot of the levels were redesigned. N64 is the original version, and Dreamcast doesn't deviate too far from it, apart from some minor additions, changes, and improvements. Now, unlike Rayman 1, I've played a good bit of Rayman 2 before. It was even the first Rayman game I've ever played, and the first game I got for the 3DS, which, depending on who you ask, is either an okay port or up there as one of the worst. Personally, I don't remember having all that many issues with it, and it's pretty much just the Dreamcast version thrown onto a handheld system so I don't think I missed out on anything major. Rayman 2 is often regarded as one of the best in the series and sometimes even being considered as the best 3D platformer, but if you were to say that to 10, 11 year old me, I'd have a pretty hard time believing you. Don't get me wrong, I didn't think the game was bad or anything, I finished it quite a few times and I always played it on long road trips, but Funnily enough, it never really set off that spark for me. In fact, I eventually cared so little about the game that I let one of my friends borrow it and I think that was probably the last time I saw my copy of Rayman 3D. Now this was back in 5th grade, but don't think I forgot about it, Jonathan. You fucking owe me, you slick fuck! Nah, in all seriousness, I never really cared too much. At that point, I've played the hell out of a game that I already wasn't very attached to. But as time went on, and when I eventually became a Rayman fan, I became interested in revisiting this game. Was I too much of a stupid dumb idiot kid to realize I was playing a masterpiece, or was I right in thinking that this game might have been a little overrated? Now I'll be playing the PC port, which I believe is an exact rip of the N64 version with a few technical improvements like better audio quality and visuals. But one thing it does really suffer from is that setting this game up on a modern system is the polar opposite of plug and play. Like, I mean, you can certainly try playing with default settings if you're fine with an outdated resolution and a really ass-backwards control scheme that makes this borderline uncomfortable to play. Which you can't even change at all, nor can you work around it by setting up a controller because from what I've read, this game is really weird with controller compatibility. Thankfully, Rayman Control Panel solves all of those issues with relative ease. It still takes a bit of tinkering, but I'm really just glad that I don't even have to deal with these keybinds. Seriously, why is space to attack yet A is to jump? On what planet does this make sense? Oh yeah, and I see those arrow key movements too, but this is like the least outlandish thing with this entire image. Rayman 2 starts off on a very different note than its predecessor. You go from happy cartoony vibes to Jesus Christ, everything is depressing and gloomy no thanks to the robo-pirates who have apparently enslaved 18,900 people and counting. In fact, their forces are so strong that they've managed to capture Rayman and his new oafish toad friend Globox. These two are happy to be reunited in such dire times, however, this is very short-lived when Rayman goes on to explain that he is completely powerless and is unable to fight against the growing robo-pirate horde. Not all hope is lost though, Globox being the good friend that he is gives Rayman a silver lump that he fished out from his fat gullet. This gives Rayman just a small portion of his strength back, but it's enough for them to escape the slave ship through this very conveniently placed slide that was just blocked off with some chicken wire. This is your first few seconds of gameplay, which shows you that you've actually got a health bar this time around that you can fill up by collecting these red lums, and start getting used to these guys because you'll be coming across wide varieties of them throughout the game. I guess you could say that the Tings are now a Ting of the past. End the show now. As minor as this change might seem, I do really like it. The game emphasizes the importance of picking up these little guys, especially the main yellow lums. They're not simple collectibles that will increase your life count if you get a hundred of them. No, that's not even a thing anymore. Instead, the yellow lums are essential to collect if you're looking to 100% the game, as well as just progressing further since you'll need them to unlock levels. The cages make a comeback here as well, but rather than housing electoons, they instead have lums. The amount you'll need to break varies from level to level, but it is much less than it was before. The game also handsomely rewards you for taking the time to find these cages by increasing your max health for every 10 cages that you break open. 
And before you ask, 100% completion is no longer mandatory and it's so much easier to achieve compared to the previous game. I mean, so long as you keep your eyes and ears peeled, you should be able to pass every level with 100% or just a little shy of that number on your first attempt. Because thankfully Rayman 2 completely ditches the bullshit spawning system from the first one and actually hides all of its collectibles in a way that fully incentivizes exploration. But other than these two, you also have green lums that serve as checkpoints and blue lums which will refill your oxygen meter in underwater sections. There's also the aforementioned silver lums, but you're not really collecting these guys in-game, they're more just like plot MacGuffins that will give you a new ability. I know that I jumped a little ahead here, but I figured I might as well explain some of the basics first. Also, there's really nothing more to this short, slightly uneventful slide section that only serves to be a transition from here to the first level. While the duo successfully escapes the slave ship, they also wind up becoming separated from each other, all thanks to Glowbox's fat dump truck ass, and Rayman crash lands into the woods of light. God damn, what a beautiful level to start off with, seriously. In terms of graphics, I don't think this game hardly ever shows its age. Okay, I know we're looking at low poly models here, but still my mind is blown by the fact that this game manages to look so visually stunning just by being so incredibly simple. And I think a part of that has to do with the game's vibrant color palette. Even in the dreariest and brownest of levels, Rayman still pops out like a beacon of color. On top of that, you also have Ansel's super distinct art style, which I believe really came into its own here. The character designs and environments are much more grounded, yet still retain the cartoonishness of the first game, which makes sense considering the shift to a much darker tone. And honestly, while I do like Rayman 1's originality, I prefer having this instead. While yeah, it does kinda suck that we won't be seeing Bandland again, at the same time though, this world feels much more believable and cohesive now, which Yes, I know is a bit of a crazy statement to be making. At the end of the day, it all comes down to personal preference, and regardless, I still think Rayman 2 accomplishes in making a world that feels totally alien to the player in a way that feels insanely intriguing. This feeling is even greatly elevated by the jibber-jabber that the characters talk in. You might have noticed that there's subtitles here, yet all the characters talk in complete gibberish, which is pretty funny to listen to. <laughs> In the PlayStation 1 version though, this is actually replaced with full English voice acting. Not really. I feel weak and my powers have disappeared. Oh, boop. I feel like so much more personality and charm oozes out of the gibberish voice lines, especially since all of the characters talk in their own unique twangs. My favorite has to be this guy named Murphy, who talks as if he's cluing you in on some crazy government conspiracy theory he's really paranoid about. <laughs> Chemtrails? MK Ultra, Bohemian Grove? Murphy, what the fuck are you talking about? Fun fact, or more of an interesting tidbit rather, this language actually has its own name. It's called Wan Day, Wan Day E, some shit like that. It's also commonly referred to as Raymanian. This was revealed in Rayman Revolution because it was actually a selectable language option there. Another thing you'll notice immediately as soon as you jump into the woods of light is how much the controls have improved over the first game. Yeah, Rayman is no longer as clumsy and sluggish as he was before, here it's almost the complete opposite. He's super nimble, agile, and there is just the perfect amount of weight to him. I wouldn't say it removes the challenge of platforming, but it really makes him so much less of a chore to control. It also helps that you have all of his basic abilities unlocked right out the gate. There's also the animations, which Rayman 1 had that nailed down to a T, so in all honesty, there's really not that much improvement here, but it's still really fucking good to look at. Unfortunately, both the controls and animations are a little soured by the camera system, which is sadly also a problem that has plagued many other 3D platformers around this time. In Rayman 2, for the most part, it's pretty manageable, but there are times where it kind of just falls apart, resulting in an angle that doesn't really help you out in any way. Eventually, you run into Glowbox's kids, which, Jesus Christ, my man was busy. Understandably, they're a little upset that their dad suddenly went MIA and has probably been kidnapped yet again by vicious robo-pirates. But Rayman's first order of business is meeting with Lee the Fairy, who apparently is also being held captive by, you guessed it, the robo-pirates. Yeah, don't bother asking about Batilla, she's not even mentioned here once. My headcanon is that since I, and probably many others, didn't 100% complete Rayman 1, she probably rotted away in Mr. Darkstink Dungeon. 
In fact, you could just forget everything about the first game. Rayman 2 takes everything its predecessor established and throws it in the trash. Like I said, the imaginative locations are gone, the electrons are gone, Joe is gone, which thank fuck I don't want to see that green googly-eyed jackass again. Fuck you. Bazit kinda makes a cameo appearance as an ambient creature, at the same time though he is a mosquito and even in real life these fuckers all look the same. And then Mr. Dark is completely forgotten about too, his villainous throne being overtaken by Admiral Razorbeard, the head honcho of the Robo Pirates. He may look a little goofy, but from the very start, this guy and his crew have already accomplished so much more than Mr. Dark, who just kinda takes a fancy plasma globe. Honestly, it really seems like this game goes to great lengths just to tell you how heartless these robo-bastards are. Like, not only are they okay with slavery, but they seemingly don't have any qualms about child labor either. In the level Iron Mountains, they straight up just kidnap Globox's kids and force them to work in mine shafts. Oh yeah, and they kept them hostage in a place known as, I shit you not, the Reformatory for Disturbing Children. There's also Whale Bay, a level where you have to rescue another one of Rayman's friends, Carmen the Whale. Murphy informs you that the pirates plan on using her blubber so they can oil their ship's engines. Maybe I'm reading too far into this, but I think that's doublespeak for, oh yeah, they want to kill her. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you can get whale blubber any other way than by having to kill a whale. Unless this world has some wacky alternative, like you could slurp it through a silly straw or something. Either way, it's still pretty disturbing for a kid's game. The crazy thing is, it doesn't even stop here. There's a cutscene where Razorbeard straight up chows down on a lump, bringing the total number you have to collect for 100% completion from 1000 to 999. Honestly, I can't even hate on that, he just made my job a little easier. Oh, a cage just out in the open like this? <laughs> wow, I don't think they could have made completing this game any easier. Oh, you're not lums. Also, there's four of you. How'd you fit in a normal cage like th You know, I should really just stop asking any questions. I shouldn't even need to point this out anymore, but this is a series about a guy who has no limbs. It's already pretty obvious that any sort of logic or reason is going to be thrown out the fucking window in these games. Anyways, these are the teensies. As you can see, they are very small people, and they also can't make up their minds about who should be the king and their small little posse. These guys, as indecisive as they might seem, will help us find the Leela Fairy and ultimately get us to Razorbeard through this level map known as the Hall of Doors. In some other versions, this is a full world map known as the Isle of Doors. And yes, I do really need to emphasize that Isle part because otherwise it would have sounded like I'm saying I love doors. The next level that we jump into is the Fairy Glade, which gives us our very first taste of this game's combat. And, well, it's not bad. It's serviceable, but there's a lot of room for improvement here. A lot of the fights you'll get into with Razorbeard's pirate army is usually just a one-on-one -on -one with you and one of his henchmen, and it all mostly boils down to strafing around, charging up a shot when you eventually unlock that ability, or just mindlessly shooting until they drop dead. Yeah, and adding to the list of things that this game retcons, Rayman can no longer throw his punches. He instead shoots these glowy orbs, which seems like a really unnecessary change, especially since these do everything that his fists did in the first game. Apparently though, it was originally planned that he'd be able to punch normally, but due to technical limitations, it was hard to translate something like this into 3D while also making it look good. Even though the combat is a little bland, it never really bothers me. Part of it is because it's far from being the worst thing in the world. A lot of these fights are over before you even know it, and the only thing you really have to put up with is how mind-numbingly simple it is. These enemy encounters are also really kept to a minimum. I mean seriously, not only are they pretty small to begin with, but they are very few and far between, and because of that, I never found myself rolling my eyes over having to fight another enemy. It's not something that overstays its welcome, and I appreciate that. It doesn't make this game feel like it's trying too hard to be something else, it is still just a 3D platformer with some combat sprinkled in that isn't anything too crazy. Other than this, there's nothing else that's really noteworthy in this level. You go through it, and at the end you meet up with Lee, who's in a weakened state because of this machine that's absorbing all of her powers. I guess this is kind of like a mini-boss, but the only thing you really need to do here is just throw explosive barrels at it. There is also a neat little trick you learn where if you're ever in a situation where your hands are full and something is coming at you, you could toss the object that you're carrying straight into the air and quickly shoot at whatever's in your way. Once you're done dealing with the machine, Lee rewards you with another silver lum, giving you the ability to grapple onto purple lums, which are one of the few things that make a return here from Rayman 1. 
One of its main and primary uses is allowing you to grapple onto these things which are known as pink lums. Pink lums. Pink lums. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Purple? Fucking purple? I thought these guys were always called pink lums. When did their names change? Also, they don't even look the slightest bit purple. The only way they could look anywhere close to that color is if you squint your eyes and tilted your head a bit. Okay, yeah, and I know in Rayman 1 they were never even called lums, they were technically known as flying rings, but look, it's the same shit, different asshole, don't even fucking argue with me. Lee also tips us off to a guy named Polycus, some divine being that's capable of giving us enough power to completely bitch slap the pirates out of existence. The only problem is that he sleeps, and he can only be awakened if Rayman collects all four of the ancient masks, which is now our next mission. Can I take a second to talk about how much I love the whole idea behind Polycus? Like, not only is he a god, but he's also supposedly the creator god which is revealed in the game's manual. And he's just a fat half-naked frog thing with long dangly arms wearing big baggy pants and a goofy top hat. Like, of course, in a game series like this, how else would a god look like? Also, while I was skimming through the manual's pages, I found that there's a really weird amount of backstory to this game that is hardly ever brought up, and it seriously doesn't deserve that kind of treatment. The shit that you can find here, while it's kind of basic, I find it to be pretty fascinating. There's this entire page that's entirely dedicated to describing the backstory of Rayman. Now, don't get too excited because his origins are still completely ambiguous, but hey look, I guess they didn't forget about Mr. Dark. It's also revealed that Polycus's powers come from his dreams. That is how he communicates with Rayman while he's still sleeping, and it's also how he creates things. Then it also goes on to explain just how powerful Razorbeard is, saying that he's infamous for reducing a hundred peaceful planets to cosmic dust. For some reason though, he doesn't want to do that to Rayman's world, he just wants to enslave everything that breathes. And here's a little fun fact for you, Globox apparently has 650 kids. How do you even manage that? The devs literally had zero reason to put so much effort into writing this much lore for a game where most players, especially those of a younger age, are just going to skip through it. Yet they did so anyway, and that's why I like this game's world building so much. Genuinely, I'd love to go on a huge lecture about Rayman lore, but that's going to have to be a topic for another day. Plus, I think it's for the best that I cover all the games first before I dive further into this rabbit hole because, believe me, it kinda gets a little complicated. For now though, we'll continue moving forward and hop into the next level, the Marshes of Awakening, where we meet up with another one of Rayman's friends, Sam the Snake, who kindly gives us a ride through the marshes. This is one of the main things I love about this game, is how much variety it packs into each of its levels. It's what keeps this game from being monotonous. One second you're just playing through a typical platforming level, and the next you're doing something completely new, and Rayman 2 does it almost perfectly. I say almost because some of this isn't going to be everyone's cup of tea. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of Sam because the controls here are dog water, but still, I respect what the devs are trying to accomplish here, and they did a pretty good job. It's a little annoying, but it's far from being my least favorite level. Shortly after this, there's Menhir Hills, where you get to ride around on these things known as shells, which as you can see, they're literally missiles with legs on them, and they also make horse sounds for some reason. <laughs> A lot of people tend to rant about how sensitive the controls are during these parts, and yeah, they are kind of sensitive, but coming from me, a dude who played through these with a keyboard, I really didn't think they were that bad. I don't know what it is, but I didn't find these to be anywhere near as unbearable as some people made them out to be. In all honesty, I actually really like them. It's fun, and every time the shell is brought back, there's always something new. Like in the Sanctuary of Stone and Fire, where all of a sudden these guys can now completely defy the laws of gravity. Also, another thing that makes a return from Rayman 1 in this level is the plums. You could forget about riding them through water, that shit's for pussies now. Instead, you could ride them through fucking magma. Yeah, again, Swiss Army Knives of the Rayman universe. Another unpopular opinion I think I might have is that I like one of the later levels top of the world, where you just hop onto a rocket-powered chair and start swinging around to avoid obstacles. I don't understand how you could hate this level, I don't think it's hard at all, it's pretty simple, and again, I find it to be kind of fun. Also, the song that plays here is easily at least in my top 10 favorite tracks in this entire game. There are a few times where the game doesn't introduce any new gimmicks, but rather spices up a typical level into something that is a lot more memorable. A prime example of this would be the Precipice, a level that from start to finish you're being chased by a pirate ship that's constantly chucking bombs at you, and you have to keep a consistent pace otherwise the platforms you're standing on will topple over and you'll fall to your death. Basically just an auto-scroller in 3D. 
And the best thing about it is that it's actually done pretty well. You're given more than enough time to react to any sort of obstacles. The only thing that really irks me about this level is that the camera angles can be kind of weird at times, but that's a completely minor issue here. Rayman 2 tries its hardest to make sure that you won't forget a single moment that you spend playing it, and you know, it does a really fucking good job of doing that. I say this with absolute confidence, but I firmly believe that I could easily list off like more than half the levels in this entire game just off the top of my head, all because they have something really special going for them that never fails to deeply etch itself right into your little brain. Like at the end of Men Here Hills, you come across yet another one of Rayman's friends, Clark, who's been poisoned, and the only way you can cure him is by retrieving an antidote from the Cave of Bad Dreams. So you have to quickly backtrack to the marshes, go through an alternate path, and then you meet with Jano, the guardian of the cave. He strikes up a deal where if you can get to the antidote before he does, he'll spare your life, but if not, then he'll show no mercy. Honestly, this level is pretty easy, but I do like the whole spooky vibe that it's going for. However, once you get so close to the very end, you see Jano pulling himself up from the ground and initiating a chase sequence where the camera gets thrown into his mouth, and you see him salivating as he's catching up behind you. So many people will say that this shit gave them nightmares when they were younger, and I can't exactly relate because I was already a bit too old when I first played this game, but I can definitely see how kids could find this traumatizing. The music becomes so intense, and then there's Jano's dialogue that opens up the level that will just bring younger players to the edge of their seats. All of it is so good, and it creates a memory that you'll likely never forget. Hands down, one of my favorite levels is the Sanctuary of Water and Ice. Now, compared to everything else that I've mentioned here, there isn't anything that's too special about this one except for the music. Yes, I know I've already brought this up when I covered Rayman 1, but I think it'd be criminal for me to just say I like this soundtrack and leave it at that. Holy shit, what gave this game the right to have such stellar music? A part of what makes it so great is that it's actually pretty complex and dynamic. You really can't attach it to one single genre because it basically covers everything. You've got tribal, atmospheric, folk, blues, some sort of industrial music, jazz, hip-hop, rock, metal, hip-hop, and metal. It does it all and yeah, it frequently plays around with a bunch of different sounds and it never ends up sounding like some kind of fucking carnival. Oftentimes tracks will also completely shift depending on whatever action you're doing or if you're in a certain part of the level. So check this out for instance, I pick up this orb and then all of a sudden the music becomes upbeat and energetic. I don't know why it's doing that, I don't think picking up an orb is this fantastical, but fuck I can't really complain, this shit's a bop. Also you really can't hate on a game soundtrack when it randomly decides to start sounding like a Pink Floyd song. If you want to give the soundtrack a quick listen, I'll give you a short list of my personal favorites. There's the aforementioned Sanctuary of Water and Ice on top of the world. There's also the Canopy, which I used earlier. This one starts off a little slow, but oh man, when that muted trombone starts ripping, I can't help myself from just grooving along to it. Whale Bay the Bubble Trail is also worth checking out, especially if you're in the mood for something much more atmospheric. When it comes to ambient underwater tracks, this one is definitely on par with Donkey Kong Country's aquatic ambience. Hell, I'd even argue it's a tiny bit better, but you know, I also might just be a little biased. All of the combat music fittingly kicks a lot of ass too. Doesn't matter what it is, boss music or all four of the pirate fight themes, they're all fucking great. And a few honorable mentions, Walk of Life, Riding the Shell, The Precipice, and the main theme. Now going back to the Sanctuary of Water and Ice, this level actually gives us our first ancient mask, but in order to obtain it, we first need to defeat the Sanctuary's guardian, Axel. Yeah, that was the entire boss fight. Unfortunately, the biggest issue with Rayman 2 is that the bosses here aren't very good. Almost all of them heavily rely on platforming rather than anything else, which isn't inherently bad, but how this game goes about doing that makes these fights really unexciting and painfully easy. You actually end up fighting Jano after the chase sequence. The reason why I put air quotes around fighting is because this entire thing is you slowly going up to him while he gives you skulls to jump on. You don't beat the shit out of him or anything, you just do this. It's so anticlimactic. You'd think this fight would have been a bit more eventful when it started off like this. Another Sanctuary Guardian fight is with Fouch. 
This one is nowhere near as bad, but it's still so lackluster. The only thing you do is run away from him, dodging his little fireballs, and when you get the chance to, you spring up into the air and shoot a stalactite down at him. Repeat this a bunch of times with very little to no change, and bam, you've got another mask. And how can I even forget about Umber? A boss that you defeat by doing jack shit. Yeah, no, really, the only thing you need to do is stand on top of his head and wait for him to slowly drown himself in lava. Okay, since I didn't 100% complete Rayman 1 for you guys, I think the least I could do here is actually go through the final boss. But first, I think it's important to highlight just how much is at stake here. Like, not only is Glowbox essentially being held at gunpoint by Razorbeard's mech the Grolgoth, but the fate of the world is entirely dependent on the outcome of this fight. And before you even get to this point, you literally have to slide through Razorbeard's slave ship while it's collapsing and fly through it like some shit out of Star Wars. With that much buildup, surely the fight would be nowhere near as disappointing as every other boss in this game. Oh, it's not that good. Okay, it's not horrible, but it's just flawed. The first phase is probably the best here because it actually feels like you're fighting Razorbeard and his giant mech. You're not chasing it, or it's not chasing you, this is actually just a good old round of fisticuffs. But once you get to the second phase, that's when this entire thing goes tits up. You ride around on the flying shell and you have to pick up these power-ups that allow you to shoot projectiles at Razorbeard. The problem is that these power-ups are crammed in these narrow corridors that are packed with a whole bunch of debris that you have to swerve around. And to add to that, Razorbeard also shoots his own homing projectiles which you can't really destroy, you just have to shake them off every once in a while with some scuffed maneuvers. Which is really frustrating to do when you're trying to pick up a power-up and you also have to slip through a bunch of debris. As you can probably imagine, it's quite easy to die here all because you don't have enough space to be doing the shit that the game wants you to pull off, and if you die, any progress you've made on the fight gets reset and you have to start over. This fight doesn't get any better towards the end when the lava randomly rises, forcing you to be even quicker about picking up the power-ups and giving you even less space to avoid Razorbeard's projectiles. Honestly, this isn't even a very hard boss fight and on paper it probably wouldn't even sound too bad, but it's the execution that makes it fucking annoying. Hell, you know, if the arena was just a hair or two bigger, I probably wouldn't even be complaining about this whole thing. You want homing projectiles that insta-kill? That's fine by me, but just give me enough space so it doesn't feel like I'm flying through someone's asshole. Now with all of that being said, what do I think of Rayman 2 after finally revisiting it so many years later? <sighs> okay, I'm not trying to pull your leg here, but I truly do think that Rayman 2 deserves a spot as being the first S-tier game I've ever covered on this channel. Yes, I'm being dead serious. Does it have problems? abso fucking lootly But thankfully this time around, Rayman 2's low points are so greatly outweighed by the many things this game does exceptionally well. On the surface, I think it's pretty easy to underestimate Rayman 2, and because of that, I sort of feel like many of you might think I'm completely fucking bonkers for putting what looks to be a baby game over anything I've covered in the past two years. Shit, it even might look a bit insulting, and if you feel that way, I get you. But god, I really don't think Rayman 2 belongs in any other spot on the tier list. For what seems like such a silly, goofy game, believe me, it does an excellent job of doing everything it can in its power to pull you in. And before you even know it, you'll be fully invested in this well-crafted, surreal world that's represented by such a gorgeous art style, filled to the brim with characters that while most of them have a short amount of screen time, you can't help but just love each and every one of them. Then you've got a surprisingly gripping story that paves the way for some of the most memorable moments you'll play through in any game, and being accompanied by a soundtrack that is equally as unforgettable. It's really no wonder why so many people consider this as a timeless masterpiece because it truly has everything it needs to be one. Without a single doubt in my mind, if you want to get into the series or hell, just platformers in general, look no further than Rayman 2. I should also mention that similar to Rayman Redemption, Rayman 2 is getting a fan-made HD remaster done in the Unreal Engine by a small team known as New Dawn Games. I'll be honest, I'm usually not a fan of these Unreal Engine HD remasters, but seeing the amount of work that the small team has done through screenshots and even just the teaser trailer, my god this shit looks amazing. I'll leave a link to the website down below for you to check out, along with the link to Rayman Redemption. With how much of a huge commercial success this game was, it's obvious to anyone that the best course of action to take would be to let the train keep rolling, and thankfully it seemed like Ubisoft wasn't opposed to giving the Limbless Man a full trilogy. However, there is one tiny risk involved in doing this now. Will this next entry in the series live up to the high standards that Rayman 2 has set, or will it forever be overshadowed by its predecessor's greatness? Oh, dope. Uh -huh. 
Check this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. 56 enormous levels, massive power-ups, outrageous enemies, huge features, huge game. Yeah. Rayman 3 Hoodlum Havoc. Rated E for everyone. Rayman 3 Hoodlum Havoc was initially released on February 21st, 2003, for the GameCube, then PlayStation 2, then PC, then PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, the mobile phone, and the GBA. Yeah, thankfully this time around Rayman 3 wasn't ported to every system under the sun. I think this is partially because at this point in time the console wars were already over, and the only major companies that were in the market was Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft. Though, that didn't really stop Ubisoft from slapping Rayman 3 onto the mobile phone and even the fucking Nokia N-Gage for some reason. To cut straight to the chase, Rayman 3 kind of got the short end of the stick. This game is always seen or treated as the black sheep of the series, and I think right off the bat the reason why it's like this is because while this game's development history wasn't nearly as convoluted as its predecessors, it did take a huge major blow, which is that Michel and Cell took a step back from being the captain of the helm and instead took on more of an advisory role all because he wanted to focus on other projects, one of which being Beyond Good and Evil. Now, do I think Rayman 3 deserves being the overlooked entry in the series? Honestly, I'm not really qualified to answer that, and it's not because I haven't played the game, that couldn't be any further from the truth. When I first got around to playing Rayman 3, I want to say I was a sophomore or junior in high school, so somewhere in the ballpark of 15 and 17 years old. I was already starting to become a big fan of the series, all thanks to Rayman Origins. My god, I fell in love with Rayman 3. I remember booting it up and going through the entire game from start to finish on one sitting and then just getting to the credits and being like, damn, that was a good fucking game. Now you'd think with that much admiration I'd surely play through it a bunch more times, but sadly enough that was the one and only time I was actually able to complete Rayman 3. I have tried to play through it a handful of times since then, but if I was lucky enough I'd get about halfway through, drop the game, and move on to something else. And that's why I can't exactly say if this game truly deserves being the overlooked entry. I haven't fully completed it in years, and genuinely I have no clue why it's like this. I mean, to be totally transparent with you, the idea behind all of this first started because of my weird mixed feelings towards this game. Originally, I planned on only covering Rayman 3, just so I had a good reason to play through all of it and hopefully get to the bottom of what deters me from playing through a game that I initially loved. Then once I was done with that, I'd backpedal and cover the whole series one game at a time. Then somewhere along the lines that completely changed, and I instead decided to do one whole monstrous video on the trilogy. For me, it's easier to structure a video this way, and again, this is like my way of showing appreciation to a series that I really enjoy. All of that leads us to where we are today, about to boot up Rayman 3 again for the first time in about 5 or 6 years with the intent of actually finishing it. But before we begin, I should bring up that compared to Rayman 2, 3 runs like a dream on modern systems. I mean, you could basically play this the moment you install it without needing any fan-made patches, so long as you're fine with sticking to the highest supported resolution, which is 1280x720. If you're not okay with that, use the Rayman control panel. Or alternatively, you could also use the better Rayman 3 mod by Ripshark. When it comes to keybinds and controller support, all of that stuff can be figured out right in the main menu, so there's no need to lose sleep over that. I should also address the elephant in the room here, which is Rayman's new design. It's sleek and... Cool. It's very characteristic for the era that this game came out in. A lot of other platforming mascots were shifting to designs that were much edgier and sharper. There's a bunch of factors that caused this, but I think the biggest one is that gamers in the 80s and 90s were starting to grow out of the cute family-friendly platforming mascots. They were becoming teenagers and shit like this wasn't really that cool anymore. Instead, it was all about Jenko jeans, smoking dubs, and listening to Cold Chamber or whatever the fuck. So some game studios decided to try and adapt to this. Naughty Dog's Jack and Daxter became noticeably edgier in the next installment. The same kind of goes for Ratchet and Clank. Then, like I said, some of the mascots of yesteryear took on designs that are much sharper. Just look at what they eventually did to Spyro. They even made Elijah Wood voice him. For Crash, it was definitely his Crash of the Titans and Mind Over Mutant design that really showed this off, but I always thought that his twin sanity design was kind of the catalyst or patient zero for this. As you can see, he's got the pointer mohawk, the denim jorts, and some scuffed converse sneakers. I always found it funny that they did this because this design, as good as it is, does a pretty terrible job of reflecting the personality that the game went for. You'd think the soundtrack would be rock or metal or something, but no, it's just beatboxing and mouth noises. And the story is just about two evil parrots that want to take over the universe. Yeah, not exactly very edgy. 
Rayman 3 is also no different. Despite how pissed he looks, this game went for an overly zany cartoony vibe. Like it's such a drastic contrast from the mature serious tone that its predecessor had that playing these games back to back will give you fucking whiplash from just how all over the place the tone is with this series. And I think that's another reason why Rayman 3 is so overlooked. It seems like Ubisoft wanted this to be a game that would never take itself seriously, and while there's nothing completely wrong with doing that, the way they went about showing it off was... questionable. The piss jokes, man. Just why did they try marketing this game with piss jokes? Who thought this was a good idea? Like, it's funny, I'll give them that, but for a conclusion to a trilogy, this probably didn't make a whole lot of good first impressions. Okay, well, let's just hope that Rayman 3 is actually a huge game with huge features, and obviously I don't mean that in the metaphorical sense. You know, I gotta hand it to them, the story here is pretty clever. It opens up on a peaceful, serene night when all of a sudden it gets disturbed by an epidemic where all of the red lums get transformed into these new evil black lums, the swarm being led by one named Andre, his main goal is to take over the whole world. It's also shown here that with a swarm big enough, the black lums can transform themselves into hoodlums, these stitched gun-wielding scarecrows. Crows. This one in particular chases after Murphy, who leads him right to where Globox and Rayman are sleeping. The trio frantically scrambles to hoof it, but Rayman is still schnoozing away. So in a desperate attempt to drag him along, Globox clumsily tears off his hands and runs off, leaving Murphy with no choice other than to grab Rayman by his hair and fly off, putting us right into an on-rail segment where we have to dodge enemy projectiles. People are kinda quick to shit on this whole segment because it's the only part in the whole game that's on rails and it doesn't really provide the player with any useful information apart from maybe telling you that the red lums are again used to refill your health bar, but I don't really have any issues here. If this thing was drawn out to be 5 minutes long, then that'd be a completely different story, but this lasts only for like 10 seconds. And honestly, let's not pretend that Rayman 2 didn't start off almost the exact same way. Really, what is the point of this? To get a feel for how to control Rayman while he's sliding? I mean, I could kind of see it, but if that's the case, shouldn't this be a bit longer and maybe throw in a few easy jumps here and there? I don't know, that's just my two cents. You're also immediately greeted to the voice cast that this game has. The gibberish is gone here, instead being replaced by understandable human languages. While you might think I'd be bummed out by this change, I actually really like it, all because the cast that they got for this game is phenomenal. You've got David Gassman, who voiced the limbless man in the PlayStation versions of Rayman 2. Fucking Billy West as Murphy, which they could not have picked a better suiting voice for this character, especially since he's now the wisecracking comedic relief. Seriously, I don't think I can imagine Murphy being voiced by anyone else other than West. Then John Leguizamo as Globox, and hell, they even got Ziggy Marley to voice the secondary antagonist Reflux. Also, a bit of a fun fact, this isn't the first time Billy West was involved with anything Rayman related. He actually voiced the dude in the English dub of his own animated series. Yeah, there was a Rayman TV show that only aired in France, and it wasn't very good. In fact, it was so bad that it was cancelled halfway through its first season. It, it kinda goes without saying, but this show was fucking weird. Barely any of the characters from the games make an appearance here apart from Razorbeard, who for some reason gets reduced down from a powerful menacing villain to a circus employee? Then the strangest of all, Globox got replaced with this uncanny noodle named Lacmac. There's actually a whole conspiracy theory floating around that the reason why Globox wasn't in this series is because the showrunners thought that a big frog would have been offensive and racist to French viewers. Also, I don't think the decision to make Rayman sound like a New Yorker that just downed a whole pack of rolling rocks in five minutes really helped with the show's success. We better get out of here if we want to stay that way. But it's clear to see, the bar is fake. Our friend here can fix your car. No reason to panic, it's just a car. Cookie, this is the best thing you invented since sliced bread. If you want to check it out for yourself, you could watch all four episodes of the show right here on YouTube for free. Though, honestly, you'd be better off watching literally anything else. It's not terrible, it's just kind of brain rotting. Anyways, back to Rayman 3. After the Unreal segment, you get a little cutscene where Murphy recaps everything that just happened all through the power of fourth wall breaking and reading the game's manual, then going on to explain some gameplay basics like the combo meter, which we'll get to in a bit. While this game has an amazing voice cast, there's two things that really sort of ruin it in my opinion. The worst is the fact that all the in-game cutscenes are horribly out of sync. I try my hardest not to pay too much attention to it, but wow, it can be very distracting at times. Combat fatigues! That's exactly what we need! You're right! Rayman, no! It belongs to the hoodlums. It might be dangerous! What are you trying to do? Make a nervous wreck out of me? Oh. 
Apparently, this is because the game was originally in French, and when it was translated to English, things kinda got a little messy. However, that's not really an excuse here. If this was made by a small indie studio, then it's understandable, but this is Ubisoft that made this. Something like this should be flat out unacceptable for a company as large as them, and they weren't really small potatoes around the time of this game's release either. The second thing that ruins the voice cast is this game's writing. I mentioned earlier how Rayman 3 went for an overly zany cartoony vibe, and that can be seen clearly through the jokes and dialogue. Murphy reading the game's manual is not the only fourth wall break you'll see here, and there are so many more that come after this. There's also a lot of pop culture references too, most of which being pretty dated. Compared to the atrocious audio sync issues, this is something I can easily live with, though obviously your mileage may vary depending on how well you can handle this game's sense of humor. And I'm not going to argue with you if you don't like it because I completely understand and I'm willing to admit that at times it can get a little grating. Though I will say when this game isn't trying to shove dated pop culture references down your throat or annoy you with juvenile humor, there's a lot of tiny quirky memorable lines that really add to the charming personality that Rayman 3 is going for, and at times it does a pretty good job of getting a chuckle out of me. For me, the best is when Murphy straight up calls you an idiot if you're taking too long to get through the tutorial. So you uh, wouldn't happen to be uh, differently challenged, would you? There's a barrel that moves, a door that opens, and a switch. Any bright ideas? Hmm? Also, I do love rescuing all the teensies because they all often say they need to go do blank, and that blank is always something that is incredibly absurd or absurdly mundane. I have to go drop the kids off at the pool. Thanks, Big Nose! Look what I swiped from the hoodlums! I need to go fire up the barbecue. While Rayman 3 is already a bit lacking in a few areas, it excels perfectly when it comes to teaching you the ropes. I really like this tutorial that you're thrusted into. To me, it's a lot like how Rayman 1 opens up with not a whole lot going on with Rayman's moveset, but this time around it's executed much better and more creatively too. Rayman doesn't have his hands, so you're just given an open space free from any danger to get a feel for the silky smooth controls and test out some of his iconic abilities. Like of course his helicopter hair before moving onto the main course, which is his fists, that we get from running into Glowbox again. Then with these you slowly learn the combat, like while strafing you're able to curve your punches around objects which the game demonstrates perfectly with this little mechanism, then finally testing your ability to pull that off on an actual enemy hiding behind cover. All in all, the combat here is leagues better than its predecessors. There's a bit more nuance to it with the inclusion of these curved punches, and there's a lot more to the enemies than just being a gradual increase in strength. A lot of the other hoodlums you'll come across force you to approach fights differently. For example, the Hoodoo Sorcerer is normally invisible and invulnerable to your attacks, unless you hit an enemy that they're protecting on the battlefield, in which case they'll appear for a few seconds giving you a small window of time to attack them. So, rather than going in guns blazing, you have to take it a bit slower and prioritize taking care of these guys first. There's also the Hecklers, these huge armored hoodlums that you'll usually encounter just by themselves. Rather than being a simple fat sponge they need to punch a dozen times to defeat, you have to get rid of these guys by utilizing the curved punches along with the new heavy metal fist power-up to blast off their protective armor. The introduction of power-ups I think is one of this game's biggest selling points. I mean two of them are used as poster boys for the NTSC and PAL versions of this game's box art. There's five of them here and they all come in the form of combat fatigues that come from a can of laser detergent. I'm really struggling to make sense of this. It's detergent, like laundry detergent, right? But it's laser laundry detergent that can transform your clothes into combat fatigues? Uh, you know, I, do I don't know, I give up. The power-ups are the aforementioned heavy metal fist, lockjaw, shock rocket, throttle copter, and vortex fist. All of these have their own duration, some lasting as long as 50 seconds and others only being 3. I'ma be honest with you, I feel kinda iffy about these. Some of them make perfect sense as power-ups, the heavy metal fist allows Rayman to do extra damage to enemies, take care of certain specific enemies, and also bash through certain objects. The throttle copter is great for traversing through areas that have a lot more verticality to them. And also giving Rayman the temporary ability to fully fly with his hair isn't anything new for this series either, the last two games had it in some form as well. There's the shock rocket which turns Rayman's fist into a guided missile. I like the idea of this one, but I never really felt like the game used this power up to its full potential. You'll pretty much only use it to get through some very basic puzzles, and there's maybe like two instances where you get to use it for combat. I'm a bit conflicted about the Vortex Fist. 
With this one, you can bring down raised platforms and again take care of certain specific enemies. Part of me feels like this would have been better as a permanent ability. It would have been something unique and interesting to Rayman's kit. Then another part of me feels like it wouldn't really work out too well if it was like that. And then you have the Lockjaw. The very concept of this power-up bothers me. This is a power down more than anything else. This is just Rayman's prior ability to grapple onto pink, I mean purple lums, but now with a fat timer and made to look flashy with these chained bear traps that also electrocute enemies, which isn't anywhere near as cool as it sounds. There's really not a whole lot to this that justifies it being turned into a temporary power-up. There's a bit more range to Rayman's attacks and they might do a bit more damage, but it's kind of hard to notice. The electrocution thing would've been neat if there was an enemy that had it as its only weakness, like it is with almost every other power-up except for the throttle copter, but that's just not the case. There are the spinneroos that are a bit easier to defeat with the lockjaw, but it's not like you absolutely need this to get past them. In fact, you could even go through these guys without needing any power-ups. I guess you could argue that like the throttle copter, it should primarily be used to traverse through an area, and that's fair, but could they not have changed this a bit so it doesn't literally feel like I'm grabbing purple lums again? Like for fuck's sake, these things even resemble purple lums. Yeah, and Rayman 3 keeps up the tradition of erasing a lot of characters that were present in the last two games. Bizit is gone, Clark is gone, Pollocus is gone, Batilla is still probably dead, Sam is actually dead, the Plums are here but they've been tremendously nerfed, and Globox's wife probably divorced them and took custody of all 650 kids. If that's the case, look, I can't blame her. Globox is straight up insufferable in this game. What was once a lovable dim-witted goof is now a cocky dim-witted prick. There are hardly any redeemable qualities about his character anymore. For almost every situation, he has some quip to throw at Rayman that comes off as more irritating than funny. Rayman, these disguises are getting a bit ridiculous. I mean, they're not even good. I recognize you right away. At times, he doesn't even really say anything all that meaningful. He just rambles on about the dumbest shit. The worst part is that Globox becomes a central part of the plot and he follows you everywhere. Thankfully, you don't have to worry about protecting him because he's got that plot armor on, you know. At the same time, though, I really wish he didn't. All of this happens because on his way to take over the world, Andre accidentally gets swallowed by Globox. And our mission for almost the entire game is to take Globox to a bunch of different doctors, so they can try and remove Andre through some methods that are rather... unorthodox. <laughs> Also, in order to get to the doctors, you have to do these funky board segments. You ride around on this little hoverboard through a simple course with a heavy psychedelic theme. I also like these, they're fun and the music, while it's a little cheesy, it's still enjoyable. Although, it's worth noting that this is like Rayman 3's equivalent to the fun gimmicks that the previous game had. Unfortunately, you won't be riding a missile with legs here or sliding away from a demon that wants to tear off your flesh, but instead you'll be doing a lot of stuff that's similar to this and not nearly as often either. The gimmicks here have more of a mini-game feel to them and they're never really the focal point of a level. A good example would be the shoe races. Rayman randomly gets shrunk down into a shoe and you're forced to play bumper cars with his other shoe. It's a very stupid concept, and you do this far too many times throughout the game. The only thing you really get out of it is a power-up so you could progress further. And it's like, okay, I guess this is to make the game not feel monotonous, but is this really the best they could come up with? Like, doing this just once is fine, but having to do this a bunch of times without anything new being added onto it, and I start getting the feeling that the devs are seriously out of ideas. At the very least, the music here is good. It sounds a lot like some of Prodigy's earlier works. Actually, I think they might have sampled Prodigy for this. In the end, this is just underwhelming compared to the many things that Rayman 2 played around with. And while the execution wasn't always great, it was still commendable for what the devs tried accomplishing. And it sucks knowing that Rayman 3 could have done a lot more, especially when you look at the snowboarding level that you get later on. This shit hyped me up back then, and it still hypes me up now. It fucking rocks. It's just an easy race with a frozen glow box, but Jesus Christ, the music here is fantastic, and you get this little ability to pull off tricks in midair. It's just so fucking cool, no pun intended. 
The one thing that sucks about this level is that you only get like a minute to enjoy it before moving on to the next part of the level. Really, you're going to make us sit through shoe bumper cars like five times throughout the game, but we only get this once for a minute? I feel robbed. After the funky board, our journey finally begins in the clearly forest. And what a journey it is. Rayman 3 only has 9 levels, which seems like a really pitiful amount, but these levels can stretch up to 30 minutes in length. They're all segmented into a bunch of different parts, so it doesn't really feel like you're going through a 30 minute level. However, that doesn't really help me. This game has a total runtime of 7 to 9 hours, with some saying it could be as low as 5, but I can't possibly be the only one that thinks that this game drags ass. I really believe this is the whole reason why I was never able to replay Rayman 3. It's just so huge that it feels overwhelming and at times endless. I think I've boiled down two factors at play here that make me feel this way, starting with numero uno. Rayman 3 has more varied level environments, but you spend way too much time in one before you start seeing a change in scenery. I know this one might sound a bit weird because Rayman 2 barely had any different environments, mostly just being vibrant green forests and icky swamps, but Rayman 2's levels weren't all monstrous in length. And that game's tendency to play around with different gimmicks made every level stand out despite the fact that visually they were all identical to each other, which brings us directly into factor number 2. The level design in Rayman 3 is kinda... Uh... Almost all of these levels, with the exception of two of them, can be summed up as you go into an arena with hoodlums to fight. You get out of that arena with a small simple platforming section that goes right into another arena with more hoodlums to fight. And you copy and paste that until you get a 30 minute level. The end. The only bit of variety you get is an easy puzzle, a game of shoot bumper cars, or occasionally you might get something that's actually new and exciting. The only levels that are different here is the longest shortcut, which has zero combat and it's all just some really cool and unique platforming puzzles. And the Desert of the Kanaran, which barely has any hoodlums, but instead has the Kanaran, this race of huge underground dwelling monsters that are supposedly invincible. So you have to sneak by these guys while the game is always bringing in new clever ways for you to do so. These bigger level layouts also almost directly contradict how you're supposed to 100% complete Rayman 3. Collectibles take a step back here and instead the game opts for a point system slash combo meter. I'll just let the Billy West fairy do the talking. Whenever you score points, the indicator appears and you switch to combo mode. This is where things get really cool. In combo mode, your actions are worth even more points. But you gotta act fast. If your scoring stops, combo mode stops. One last thing, points can buy you access to hidden levels, so try to score big! So yeah, you get points by collecting gems, defeating bad guys, and looking at these funny critters. Doing all of these in quick succession will result in you building up a combo, which adds even more points to your total score. If you want to 100% complete a level, you have to gain a shit ton of points by building up good combos. And I think you need to rescue all the teensies too, but I'm not entirely sure about that. I hate this whole system. These things work in games that are fast paced with levels that are short, simple, and easy to memorize. Levels that you can easily replay if you mess something up without feeling like you just wasted your time. Rayman 3 isn't like this, with its huge levels that have open areas with everything you need to score points being spread apart from each other, making it a pain in the ass to get to since Rayman can only go at a jogging pace. It doesn't help that there's certain things you need to do that will completely kill your flow, like these critters which require you to stop dead in your tracks and look at them for a few seconds through the first person camera, or these butterfly things that you need to sneak up on. Stuff like this just doesn't mesh well with a system where you need to be quick about doing everything. It also just sucks finding the secrets this game has, only to be given 3 stars at the end, all because you didn't keep up a good combo. Not like you'd really get anything out of achieving a full 5, those bonus levels Murphy talked about are nothing but novel and aren't at all worth the frustration and time you'll be wasting by trying to unlock all of them. At the end of Clearly Forest, you go into your first boss fight with this thing known as the Hood Stomper, this towering mechanical contraption being piloted by a little hoodlum named Master Cag. With the improved combat Rayman 3 has, the boss fights here are a huge major step up from the disappointing snooze fest that we got in the last game. They are so much more engaging and involved now. 
This one probably has to be one of my favorites. You have to quickly grab the shock rocket power up and aim it towards Master Kag. Hit him with it a couple of times and now you get to enjoy riding around the Hood Stomper, crushing all the enemy reinforcements that are coming into the arena while a very enthusiastic announcer spectates the whole fight. Oh, yeah! It's not a very hard boss fight, but just all this extra pizzazz and personality makes this so fun and enjoyable. The same applies to the second fight you go into, which is with Begoniax the Witch. This is more of a mini boss, but just the way it's done makes it a blast to always go through. It's so over the top and chaotic with how she's constantly chasing you around her cauldron. You have to defeat her by splashing some of her brew back at her to turn her into a frog, giving you the only opportunity to deal some damage to her. Be careful though, because she could do the exact same thing to you. Also, do you remember Reflux? You know, the villain I brought up eons ago that's voiced by Ziggy Marley? Yeah, well, here's a bit of background info on how this guy becomes the secondary antagonist. He was once an undefeated Kanaran champion until Rayman moseyed his way into his domain and beat his stupid ass up in the arena. No longer having the title of undefeated champion, Reflux now just looks like a big dumb circus clown in front of all of his friends, especially since the game claims that these dudes are invincible, though that might just be more of an exaggeration than something to be taken literally. Reflux becomes pissy and bitter about all of this until later on in the game when Andre finally escapes Globox's stomach and forms an alliance with Reflux. Together, these two plan on taking over the world and crushing Rayman by harnessing the powers of both the Heart of the World and the Scepter of Leptis. Leptis being a god that the Kanaran worship. All of this culminates into an epic final battle that in my opinion is definitely better than Razorbeard's, but it still has just one major flaw. This fight goes on for a bit too long. Reflux is not the type of guy that gives up so easily. You'll be fighting him through four phases, with the last one being the worst one. You have to do this weird turret vehicle section that you're not even properly introduced to until you're minutes away from this boss fight. It's a lot like how the flying shell was brought up in Rayman 2. Rather than giving the player ample time to get used to how this thing controls, the game just kind of shoves it in your face last minute. Apart from that, everything else about this fight is pretty good. I especially love the sudden change in atmosphere here, seeing Reflux becoming more and more mutated and corrupted with power, hatred, and jealousy, and the music slowly becoming more twisted and weird is fucking awesome. You also actually have to use the lockjaw for combat in the first phase here, so I guess in the end it was worth having this be turned into a power-up. Once you defeat Andre and Reflux, things go back to normal as you'd probably expect, and Rayman and Globox are seen happily resting the same way they were when this journey first started. That is until this happens. So, Rayman 3, where does this belong on the tier list? I'm feeling a strong B on this one. It took me a bit too long to realize how in a funny twist of things, my views on Rayman 2 and 3 are both directly opposite of each other. I used to think Rayman 2 wasn't all that special and that 3 was a masterpiece, but after giving these guys a second look, 2 for me is definitely the masterpiece while 3 is the one that isn't all that special. Don't get me wrong, Rayman 3 is far from being a terrible game and it has its fun moments. I'd even recommend playing it. But I think my earlier opinions on it were probably skewed by the fact that after sinking my teeth into Origins, this was the next game that I was super interested in and desperately wanted to play. And because of that, I think that's what made my first experience so... magical, for lack of a better term. This is a game that I wish I could enjoy again like I did for the first time, but looking at it with more of a critical lens, it's just so all over the place with its design. I respect the fact that Ubisoft didn't try to make this a Rayman 2 2.0, but a lot of the changes 3 brings to the table sort of end up falling flat on their face. I wouldn't mind this game's change in tone, and at times it can actually be pretty funny, but more often than not, it just tries way too hard with its humor. I don't care for a bigger emphasis on combat, but it feels like they focused on it so much to the point that it neutered the level design. It's just so linear and not nearly as interesting as the stuff we got in Rayman 2. 
Then you've got the power-ups, which to me can feel somewhat underdeveloped, and the point system that is incredibly out of place. Again, Rayman 3 is not a terrible game, and it proves a lot of things that weren't the best in Rayman 2, most notably the combat, but it still just leaves a lot to be desired. I think the Rayman series is definitely worthy of another entry, one that would perfect a lot of things that this game brought in. Find ways to take the power-ups one step further, make the level designs a bit more reminiscent of 2, giving you an incentive to fully explore the environment around you while still giving room for 3's improved combat, and perhaps even finding ways to further expand the combat. This is all just wishful thinking and just me partially talking out of my ass, but in my mind, I feel like this would have been an excellent way to wrap things up. That line Murphy just said wasn't some cheap fourth wall break. In an alternate universe, this could have been a quadrilogy retrospective, but unfortunately, that is not the reality we live in. You see, there was an actual Rayman 4 in development. It seemed like it was going to be a free-roaming beat-em-up where the main villains were going to be these ill-tempered bunnies known as the Rabbids. But due to development complications and time constraints, the game was reworked into being a party game known as Rayman Raving Rabbids. This is how the Rayman series continued for the next eight years, and around this time is also when Ubisoft started having a dismissive attitude towards their former mascot. A character that helped put the company on the map, a character that challenged the company to start developing 3D games, a character that was once their lifeblood, quickly tossed aside and forgotten about all in favor of these new party games that slowly undid the series they once spawned from. It wasn't until 2011 when Rayman finally got a small revival with Origins and then Legends a few years after. Things were looking great for a while, it finally seemed like Ubisoft remembered and wanted to show genuine interest in continuing the franchise. Ansel even posted on his Instagram back in 2017 saying that he finally wanted to give Rayman a proper fourth adventure once Beyond Good and Evil 2 finishes. Shit. The time between Legends and today is now greater than the gap between Rayman 3 and Origins. It'll be a full decade in August. Yeah, put that shit in your pipe and smoke it. Thankfully, fans have something to look forward to, which is the Rayman DLC for Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope. It's pretty poetic that the Rabbids, which initially killed off Rayman, is now the series that might breathe more life into him. However, let's be real with ourselves here. There's no clear way of telling how and when this character will ever make a full comeback. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy as fuck Ubisoft didn't completely forget about Rayman, and might I add, I love the redesign. It looks like such a good combination of all of his previous looks crammed into one and being sprinkled with a bit of a modern touch. But I've seen this song and dance so many times now. Does Ubisoft actually care about bringing him back, or are they just going to forget about him after this? Like I said, there's no real way of knowing for sure, and I'm hoping that eventually everything that I've just said will age like milk, that someday we will finally be able to get our hands on that fabled fourth entry in the series. But for now, this brings us to the end of the Rayman Trilogy.